be giving a, Sorry. Be giving a presentation about pools and the water system. Uh, for those of you who are new to H2O, uh, we are an environmental nonprofit. We provide a lot of education programs about New York City's water system and water ecology. Uh, we're blessed in the city to have great water and uh, that's because it's coming from upstate where there is a lot of nature that protects our, our reservoirs. So we teach about nature because nature gives us clean water and, it, and we emphasize to our students and, and the broader uh, public how important it is to take care of nature because we take care of nature and nature takes care of us. We, um, as part of that, do take care of nature here in the city and a lot of our parks uh, where we provide these field trips and, and, and programs. We do a lot of stewardship, maintaining flower gardens, um, uh, planting flowers, weeding, and, and, and so forth. And um, we, we invite you to, to join us for those programs. Um, okay. Uh, as David said, we ask that you stay on mute uh, while Carolina is presenting. And um, it, it makes the transmission easier and smoother if you keep your camera off. Uh, feel free to submit questions, uh, do it in the chat, that's very helpful. Um, and then we will have a Q&A after the presentation. Um, so we're gonna get started. Uh, Carolina Chechik is an architect and educator based in New York. She is a principal at Only If Architecture Office, critic at Yale School of Architecture, and lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania, Stuart Weitzman School of Design. Her work operates at the intersection of architectural and urban scales. Carolina previously worked at the Office of Metropolitan Architecture in Rotterdam and Hong Kong. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Carolina. Carolina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Matt, and uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining the talk. Um, I'm really excited um, to present the work that I've been doing for a couple of years, and it's also the first time actually presenting it publicly, so um, I'm really curious about um, any feedback or questions that may appear at the end. Um, of course, thank you, New York City H2O and Matt and David for an invitation. Um, and I wish we could be all together in person, but hopefully sometime soon, um, that will be possible. Hopefully this water and pool related talk will actually cool us off today after a pretty hot um, day. Um, so before I start, um, maybe let me share my screen first. Um, Matt, could you confirm that you can see the full screen? It's perfect. Looks great. Okay. Right. Um, so before I start, I wanted to acknowledge and thank a couple of people that um, contributed to the research, uh, whether it's through kind of academic and material input or kind of editorial eye. And those people being uh, Marta Gutman, Adrian Benepi, Mariana Mogilevich, Josh McRider, Nicholas Kemper, Alhu, and Anna Bogovich and others who are continued kind of give feedback and hopefully all of you today will join, join that list. Um, so as Matt mentioned, um, I have a practice called Only If Architecture, which is based in Brooklyn. Um, and today I'll be talking about the New York City public pools and water system, but I wanted to sketch out a little bit of the background and thinking that informed that specific research, but also approach um, to my other projects. Um, so Only If is a design practice started in 2013 and led by myself and my partner, Adam Frampton. And our work exists at the intersection of architecture and urban design. And it's very much rooted in ability to see things close up um, and at a distance. And perhaps most importantly, um, a kind of benefits of this simultaneous um, approach. Um, that has to do with our work at different scales, um, at an architectural scale, um, designing buildings with attention to detail and materials in a very hands-on way, but also at an urban scale and regional scale even um, of design where we can critically address larger questions about how cities and landscapes are formed and how they will adapt and change in the future and how we will live collectively. This 
um, approach um, of looking at the city and architecture when applied to the New York City water system starts to reveal stories and undercurrents, which is the title of the series I'm writing for the Urban Omnibus, um, that might have been otherwise um, overlooked if policy, engineering, and architecture were looked and studied without um, kind of disciplinary overlap. So my role or kind of um, a goal in the whole research was kind of understand or wear different hats um, to look at the water system and specifically public pools to understand the kind of undercurrents and kind of larger patterns that may emerge. Um, that being said, I'm not an architectural historian, I'm an architect, um, but architects being gener generalists kind of tend to wear different hats throughout all their careers. So hopefully that's, uh, that benefited uh, that specific research. Um, so because it remains out of sight, the New York City water um, supply is often um, kind of thought as purely technical matter. And the more layered private and public roles that water infrastructure plays in the urban landscape often tend to escape wider conversation. Public pools, water splashes, drinking fountains, public bathrooms and hydrants are all critical infrastructures of health, mm -hmm. hygiene and public space. And with this map, I try to actually collect all of them and show them together as kind of interconnected system of the engineering, architectural, but also public and social aspects of the whole system. Um, the Croton Catskills and Delaware watersheds located in upstate New York cover 1,972 square miles and contain 19 reservoirs with a combined capacity of 550 billion of gallons of water. By virtue of the Watershed Protection Program run by the New York City DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, the water originating from these faraway reservoirs does not require extensive filtration, whether they're flowing, whether water is flowing to private um, water taps or street hydrants. So that's definitely a kind of advantage New York City has here over um, other cities um, in the US, but also in the world. So the urban growth and increasing demand for clean water have driven the evolution of New York City complex water supply system over the past 200 years. In the 1820s, uh, city officials decided to create a public water system to replace an unhealthy and unreliable network of collection ponds and cisterns. The Croton Reservoir, Croton Dam, and Croton Aqueduct located in Putnam and Westchester counties were opened on July 4th, 1842, to provide a flow of fresh water to Manhattan. The aqueduct in particular was an enormous engineering undertaking started by Mayor David Douglas and continued by John Jervis, who led the final design stages and construction efforts. Leaving the Croton Reservoir, water cursed through a horseshoe-shaped eight and a half foot high by seven and a half foot wide brick-lined masonry tunnel. At, diff at different points along this 41 mile span, the aqueduct was buried underground, covered by embankments, cut into the rocks, and siphoned or carried across bridges through the valleys and rivers. The primary infrastructure was supported by a network of masonry ventilators, weirs, culverts, gatehouses, and keepers' houses, which assured an uninterrupted gravity flow of the water from the source to its final destination. And definitely Matt and David are the ones who know um, a lot about the whole water system and you should visit um, or join some of their walks where they actually um, kind of explain how the system works and kind of show how those um, kind of remnants of the um, Croton uh, system is actually still present um, in New York City. So I'm really encouraging all of you to check um, those programs out. So the water was carried to Manhattan over the Harlem River via the High Bridge, which also served as a pedestrian promenade. And the bridge infrastructural function was actually very quickly overshadowed by its popularity as a local tourist destination. Once it's reached the city, the water was stored in artificial reservoirs distributed across various neighborhoods. The Croton Reservoir in Central Park, now the Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis Reservoir and Jerome Park Reservoir in the Bronx, were designed as groundwater bodies with recreational paths laid out around the perimeters. So again, kind of infrastructural aspect of the water distribution kind of connects with the recreational aspect, although not necessarily thought of as part of it from the very beginning. The York Hill Reservoir in Central Park, now the Great Lawn, 
the High Bridge Reservoir in Washington Heights and the Murray Hill Reservoir were architecturally distinct structures and very kind of had very monumental presence in the city, as you can see on, on the kind of uh, right hand drawing here. The Murray, Murray Hill Reservoir, which uh, was actually the end point of the old Croton Aqueduct, was considered the public face of the whole Croton system. And as you can see in this um, lithograph, it was designed as a two chamber, 24 million gallon structure in an Egyptian revival style. And the perimeter was actually topped by a public promenade accessible by a series of staircases from the street level. So again, the kind of reservoir acts both as a kind of infrastructure, but also as a kind of recreational um, space in the city and actually a place where you want it to be seen uh, during your weekend stroll. So due to high demand for water, the system uh, kept expanding and the city local reservoirs were actually decommissioned with the completion of the new first and second water tunnels in 1917 and 1936 respectively. The site of the Murray Hill Reservoir, for instance, it was later transformed into the Bryant Park and part of the old reservoir foundations were actually used to construct the New York Public Library in 1911. So what are you looking now at on the right side of the screen? It's where the Bryant Park and New York City Public Library are located right now. The High Bridge Reservoir was actually adapted into a public swimming pool, which some of you might have you know, mentioned um, in terms of where they're going to swim in the city. And the High Bridge walkway uh, was closed to the public, but reopened recently in 2015 after kind of extensive renovation. So it doesn't carry the water anymore, but it still carries the people and a recreational aspect that, um, that was kind of built into it from the very beginning. So meanwhile, the Croton system as a whole was actually um, decommissioned in 1965 and listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1992. Several of its extant structures have been designated as historical landmarks and the aqueduct trail that I mentioned earlier alongside a stretch of the original tunnel is now a state historical park and it continues through the Bronx as a city managed park. And today, DEP, which is Department of Environmental Protection, operates two tunnels, two new tunnels that supply New York City with 1 billion gallons of water each day. After a series of delays and decades long construction of a third tunnel started in 1970, it's nearing completion. And from this tunnel, water is then distributed across the city via 6,800 mile network of pipes. So today, beyond the office and residential water tap connections, water also flows to more than 100,000 hydrants, 1,100 public bathrooms, 841 spray showers, 3,120 drinking fountains, and 65 active public pool complexes in New York City. DEP also operates 9,965 sampling stations across the city which are monitored monthly for pollutants to ensure water quality and safety. And if you haven't noticed, you can um, see sometimes a kind of um, silver painted kind of boxes um, on the poles standing on the sidewalk, which are monthly checked, opened, and water is tested um, for the quality from them. So look out for those in the city. So if the water is considered a shared asset and connective tissue, the pool for me acts as a vehicle of its collective experience and co that connects the conversation about the water supply to the question of policy, public space, recreation, and social interaction. In fact, for more than a century, the city pools have doubled as both recreational facilities and infrastructure for keeping the city cool. The New York City Department of Parks and Recreation operates 65 public pools located throughout the five boroughs, ranging from outdoor Olympic sized structures to miniature and best pocket sized sites and indoor facilities. These pools are invaluable public spaces and offer notable works of architecture on their own right. The seemingly neutral network, however, of recreational facilities has also served as a backdrop for celebrations and disputes reflecting larger dynamics around class, gender, and race, equitable access to public space, and an issue of public health. And the New York City has actually seen two major um, pool building periods that were shaped both by the kind of social forces, 
and significant pol political figures um, of their times. And I'm gonna talk about it a little bit later, but facilities from both eras still reflect these legacies and approach to city and public space making. And even as contemporary challenges and ideas present new possibilities for this now historic spaces, we may want to look at those previous examples and ways and policies in which pools, based on which pools were located to understand how plan for the future. So how can we learn from the contested history of the public city pools? Where does the pool fit within a broader exploration of the challenges around inequality, climate change, and resilience facing the future of the cities? Let's see. So with the construction and expansion of the water supply system, private bathrooms became commonplace for middle and upper class New Yorkers. However, access to fresh water was still limited for the majority of working class people. Since 1870, New Yorkers had relied on floating pools in the East and Hudson rivers, public bathhouses and natural bodies of water to maintain personal hygiene, do laundry, cool off and swim. Unfortunately, that often translated into very bad drowning statistics that kind of uh, reflected the fact that there was basically no safe place to recreate and swim in the city. In, in 1895, the New York State Legislature passed a law mandating an establishment of public baths for all cities with more 50, 000, of more than 50,000 people. This was really the case of a kind of health, um, public health, um, because of the density, because of the pollution, not only of the water in the in the rivers, but also just pollution in the city and on the streets. Kind of bathing facilities were considered places not as much as recreation, but as a kind of places to wash and clean the masses that basically lived at the time in New York City in relatively crowded um, conditions. So the first municipal bath in New York City, the Rivington Street Bath, opened in 1901. And by 1915, 15 more public bath facilities were established in Manhattan, alongside eight in Brooklyn, one in Queens, and one more in the Bronx. Inspired by European examples, the baths provided public showers, tubs, laundries, and comfort stations and restrooms. Baths sometimes doubled as recreational destinations. Some were even located within the city parks and equipped with gymnasiums and swimming pools. In 1935, several public baths across New York were renovated by the WPA, Work Progress Administration Program, but most were closed after the Second World War II. Some are still existing and actually were turned into the public swimming pools um, if they didn't hold that uh, function earlier. Um, and they survive to this day as indoor public swimming pools and recreational centers. So you can see here the Metropolitan Pool in Brooklyn, Asser Levy Pool in Manhattan that also has the kind of outdoor addition, um, Hansborough Pool um, and Recreation Center 54 um, also in Manhattan. Um, as I kind of looked at the whole cityscape, I found six that are being kind of reused, uh, but some of the bath buildings were actually turned into other functions, that being offices, banks, um, and, other, um, and other functions um, other than bathing. On July 2nd, 1936, thousands of New Yorkers attended the opening of Astoria Pool pictured here, with appearances from Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia, and Parks Commissioner Robert Moses. The pool, designed by John Hatton, was the largest of 11 swimming facilities open across New York City that summer. Built with funds from the Works Progress Administration and as part of the New Deal's sweeping investment in infrastructures, the pools reshaped the urban landscape, if not in the whole US, definitely in the New York City. So the Moses' pool building ambitions departed from these earlier facilities bath bath houses um, and their utilitarian role and instead they provided spaces for safe swimming social gathering and much needed recreation you have to also kind of place it um, at the beginning of the um, 20th century where a kind of modern lifestyle modernism and kind of modern ways of um, thinking about the life and the city um, has emerged and therefore need for recreation for kind of much larger social integration um, and mixing uh, was expressed also through construction of this uh, pools that act as, as some sort of kind of social gathering, um, social condensers. So this large 
Olympic size complexes accommodated also different uses. So not only swimming, but they also included uh, gyms um, and indoor sports where uh, accommodated in the big buildings built along those pools. Um, there were performances on the pools, there were contests, um, there were shows being kind of um, enacted, um, but also the pools had light and some of the pools were heated. So that was definitely a kind of upgrade, um, technological upgrade, um, but also functional upgrade from what the baths um, and the river um, kind of swimming facilities um, allowed for earlier. So the pools, the 11 WPA era pools, uh, created a new kind of public architecture, reflective progressive policies and evolving approach to recreation and gender integration in public space. And Marta Gutmann, who I mentioned earlier as a contributor to my research, a, who is a historian and architect and faculty member at the uh, CUNY Graduate Center and Spitzer School of Architecture at the City College of New York, says this about the gender integration, and I quote, Looking through the lens of gender also exposes a hugely empowering agenda that was happening at the pools. In many immigrant families, gender norms constrain young girls and keep them tied to domestic duties. To have the pool just a few blocks away, to be able to go, jump in and get out of the house was very important. It was also a way for young women to learn how to navigate the new self and to navigate public space and to take control of their life and free themselves of the patriarchy that was being imprinted upon them daily at home. One of the reasons that New Yorkers in general become so obsessed about race and the pools is precisely because that's where young women were taking charge of their own lives and navigating their romantic and sexual relationships without their parents watching over their shoulders. We can consider the pool as a sign of feminist awakening. End of the quote. So the pool building spree also democratized access to public swimming to a degree. And they became social melting pots and places to be seen. However, um, while modern pool facilities allowed for mixing of different classes and gender, they also amplified racial prejudice in the society. Robert Moses followed a separate but equal approach in siting pools distributing facilities across different racially segregated neighborhoods. Although pools were built with taxpayer money as a public infrastructure, many facilities were racially segregated by social practice. The violent acts by whites on black swimmers at the Highland Park Pool in Pittsburgh in 1935, Fragrant Park Pool in St. Louis in 1949, and many other locations around the country solidified the general assumption that blacks and whites should not swim together. Dedicating separate pool facilities for different races became the norm, and in some, some cases, unfortunately, a local law. In New York City, blacks and Hispanics were not banned from attending the pools legally, in white neighborhoods, but they were not welcomed either. Marta Gutman actually provides a very nuanced analysis of the complex policies and motivations behind this era of pool expansion in her article, Race, Place and Play. And it's also partially in response to the book of, um, by Robert Acaro, the power broker that describes um, kind of policies of Robert Moses and argues that many of them were very um, discriminative. So I really encourage all of you to look into those two sources. Um, so the second pool building era in New York City occurred during John Lindsay, Lindsay tenure as mayor and after stepping down of Robert Moses from his post and the parks commissioner. And this is quite an important transition uh, because it shows a kind of very different approach to the city making that both of them um, kind of believed in. Public pools in the late 60s and 70s under the Lindsay's era significantly differed from in form, size, distribution, and underlying social and urban policies from the earlier WPA era facilities. Unlike Moses, who observed the city from the perspective of a speeding car, Mayor Lindsay was famous for its walks through the often overlooked communities and neighborhoods. Where Moses saw a great effort and morphous mass that needs to be bathed, needs to be aired and needs recreation, Lindsay saw people and he believed that betterment of the individual improves the society. And John Lindsay's term actually coincided with the heightened unrest in the city and country and in the world in general, the civil rights movements and the Vietnam War protests. 
in New York and continuing white flight to suburbs, slam clearance and relocation of the communities of color to public housing were only a few policies contributing to the segregated city and ghettoization of the urban environment. Mariana Mogilevich, um, a chief editor of the Urban Omnibus and author of the recent book publication, um, The Invention of Public Space, Designing for Inclusion in Lean States, New York, and um, provides actually quite extensive kind of assessment of Lindsay approach to city making and uh, more equitable access to water and public um, space. And I'm quoting her here. There were a lot of experiments in the new and improved public spaces. There was a lot of spending on cultural and recreational programming across the city and not just in the places predominantly white that have been funded before. The small scale of this intervention was about getting things into neighborhoods at the scale of the block the centralizing and redistributing and getting things to where they haven't shown up before. It was faster and cheaper to build and avoided large scale demolition and displacement associated with urban renewal projects. During the hot summers of the 60s and 70s, the pools and water sprays and other water features were meant to help literally and figuratively keep the city cool. The first of the Lindsay pools were actually a portable structures and they could be dismantled and moved to other parts of the city or across the neighborhood if needed. They also took the form of the swim mobiles or pool that were basically pools mounted on tracks that would circle around neighborhoods in Brooklyn, Queens and the Bronx. This initial campaign was a response to a scarcity of water and a kind of immediate response to a scarcity of water facilities and cooling infrastructure in underserved areas around the city. Um, and the city subsequently began, beca began to install um, more permanent structures, but still there were not this huge Olympic sized venues that um, kind of were known from the Moses era. They were actually mini pools with, with completely standardized dimensions of 20 by 40 by three feet deep. And they were built usually on vacant lots next to schools and in neighborhoods suffering from disinvestment. And although ambition in numbers um, and fast deployment and a kind of strategic reuse of existing vacant space, these mini pools were too small for swimming, unfortunately, and they were not equipped with changing rooms. So many of them haven't survived, but there's actually quite a few, and they're all kind of mapped here, that, um, that you can still find throughout the city um, and they're usually open for, if not swimming, at least um, for cooling off during days like today. So the construction of mini pools was actually quickly phased out um, and the city started to build slightly larger um, and they were called vest pocket pools in the early 1970s and vest pocket name comes from a kind of larger approach um, to creating public space in the city and um, so-called vest pocket parks. That was also a kind of way to quickly deploy a smaller neighborhood parks in usually kind of vacant lot and kind of urban gaps. Um, so similar thing happens to the pool. They're bigger than the mini pools um, that I mentioned earlier, and but they're uniformly sized as well. Um, they were mostly done with the kind of prefabricated element. So you can see the kind of each pool is different, but it's actually made out of the same kind of elements. Um, there's usually a one swimming pool and one wading pool um, and the kind of shading and kind of um, back of house kind of storage um, structures um, next to it. So the Best pocket pools were often located next or within the parks. They were slightly bigger, so they wouldn't fit in this vacant lots um, and in the very densely populated areas that, again, didn't have access to any other recreational facilities. Um, in 2018, the Parks Department initiated a pool pools program, which involved the renovation of selected best pocket park pools that had not been upgraded basically since the 70s. So it had to do with a kind of repainting. Um, but also addition of shading, uh, sitting and planting elements alongside with free poolside activities, uh, swim classes, uh, games, sports, arts and crafts, and many, many programs that basically encourage att attendance during the summer season. There were also a couple of larger pools that were built during that time. And one of them is Kostruszko pool in uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant, personally my favorite pool in New York City. Um, and Marcus Garvey Park Pool in Harlem um, 
which uh, basically were a kind of attempt to provide a kind of larger scale facilities towards the end of the tenure of Mayor Lindsay. Um, so design and construction of the Kostushkopu were commissioned to Morris Lapidus, um, who was a New Yorker, but he was a Miami-based architect of pretty lavish and luxury hotels and pools, but who actually happened to grow up in uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant at the beginning of the century. And he was actually very happy to kind of be back and kind of provide the pool that could be accessed by everybody, not by those who can only afford a um, certain kind of level of luxury. And in the kind of um, assessment of the pool um, that was written up by Ada Louise Huxtable, architectural critic at the New York Times, we can read that quote. There is a handsome new municipal swimming pool in Bedford-Stuyvesant called the People's Pool. What got built, it's large reinforced concrete complex of swimming, diving, and wading pools with torches of color and bright brick that tries to show in spite of overwhelming necessity and visibility of its vandal proof construction and sensitivity to people and place. Ventilating stacks from sunken locker rooms and services have been grouped for a pyramid with slides. Others are concealed in a maze of bright colored ordinary plumbing pipes that form a jungle gym. Broad steps join the levels and water slide in a children pool, which has a sky blue plain aluminum pipe fountain. This is fine ingenuity on a tight budget. So you saw the pictures of the pool before and you see the picture right now. Um, I should have mentioned that all the images that you're seeing that are current are a part of the research and basically kind of photographic documentation of all the New York City pools. Um, the images are relatively empty in comparison to how they looked earlier. It has to do with when the pictures were taken, but definitely the kind of attendance of the pools comparing to when the times, um, at the times when they were open and today has dropped. I'm actually curious if this year um, and the kind of heat and staying in the city actually kind of have had impact on a kind of higher attendance um, to those pools. The statics is, statistics are yet to be seen as the pool season is still open. So it was not until 1964 that Title III of the Civil Rights Act legally desegregated public facilities, including pools, and not until 1968 that the Fair Housing Act legally banned housing discrimination in the United States. These policies exacerbated the retreat of white population from public swimming facilities to backyard pools and private clubs. In her recent book, The Sum of Us, Heather McGee describes the extreme example of the municipal recreation department, zoo, and public pool in Montgomery, Alabama, all being shut down or closed following court enforcement desegregation of the city recreational facilities 1959. The council decided to, she says, the council decided to drain the pool rather than share it with their black neighbors. Of course, this decision meant that white families lost a public resource as well. Urban pools and other public facilities across the country fell into disrepair. So while the kind of federal policies subsidized construction of segregated suburbs, they also withdrew the investment in from the public infrastructure in the US cities. And that's a kind of larger kind of pattern that kind of emerged starting from the kind of late 50s to, to 70s and 80s. And basically that meant that those who stayed in the city and it was actually predominantly minority, um, black and Hispanic populations were kind of uh, left without kind of investment in public infrastructure. So together with rapid suburbanization and technology that also facilitated the construction of the private pools, um, private clubs, which of course were not considered a public um, facilities, therefore they were not, um, didn't have to follow the law of desegregation. And that being said, the, the, the kind of desegregation um, basically persisted, um, even though legally it was banned in the US. So how it looked in New York City. So in New York City, generally the kind of pools were relatively um, integrated, although of course, as I was mentioning earlier, they were not segregated by law, but basically by social practices, but particularly the McCarran Park pool case maybe give us kind of the insight of how um, the kind of late 60s, 70s um, and 80s kind of social tensions have impacted the existence of the pools. Um, so in New York City, this dynamics uh, described by McGee led to disclosure of McCarran Park pool in 1984. And after a period of abandonment and threats of demolition, local artists actually brought the pool back to life through live performances 
paving kind of the way for its eventual reuse as an open air concert venue until um, 2008. The first discussions actually about renovating the Makaran Park Pool were circulated in the late 1970s, but at the time the Makaran Park Pool area had a very different demographic um, neighborhood from today. Uh, and it was dominated mostly by Polish and Italian immigrants who were not open to swimming with neighbors from nearby African-American and Dominican communities. The pool was landmarked in 2007, renovated and reopened for swimming in 2012, um, mostly due to efforts of um, Adrian Benefi, then the parks commissioner under the mayor of Bloomberg, and um, who was also responsible for overseeing the whole process. And by then, also the area's demographic has shifted, um, welcoming a significant number of younger and kind of new incoming people who saw the pool more than a kind of social asset, um, than a threat. And that way, the pool, the pool is still there today. It's renovated um, and you're all welcome to, of course, um, use it. So coming kind of closer to today, um, the last public pool built in New York City was the Floating Pool Lady, uh, which was a kind of initiative by um, Anne Bathenweiser um, and the Neptune Foundation um, that was inspired by the historical floating baths in the rivers. So um, basically after uh, kind of purchasing a barge in New Orleans and kind of renovating it to accommodate the pool and other facilities, um, the pool was kind of shipped from the south to, to New York City. And after docking at several temporary locations along the Brooklyn riverfront, um, the pool, which is the kind of basically a barge, um, found a kind of permanent summertime home in the Bronx since 2008. And um, there's also a recent publication by Anne L. Wittenweiser, which I recommend to for those interested in that story uh, to read, which is titled The Floating Pool Lady, a quest to bring a public pool to New York City's waterfront. Um, and it gives us a kind of glimpse into water spatial politics in New York City and how kind of location of that pool was actually very difficult and somewhat still um, kind of contested. And um, on the right side, um, more recently, the City Economic Development Corporation has given a permission to proceed with due diligence on the construction of the Platts pool that many of you might have heard of or have seen the images. And it's a kind of result of a 10 year campaign supported by Platts pool nonprofit um, architects, Don Ping Wong, um, Juana Stanescu, and um, Archie Lee Coates, um, private individuals and public authorities to build a floating swimming facility in the East River. And this pool, um, it's different in a way that it's designed to filter the river water, ensuring safe and swimming condition. Um, while accommodating also kind of range of swimming um, and water related um, um, kind of activities. So there is a kind of Olympic land flap swimming, there's a sports lounging, there's a kind of children pool, there's a wading pool. And um, the pool hopefully and perhaps um, is a kind of introduction to the next chapter of thinking about the water and the pool infrastructure uh, in the city, taking into account the kind of issues of pollution and the climate change. And um, speaking of that, just maybe to like kind of zoom out for a little bit uh, or jump out of the pool <laughs> during the summer months, the New Yorkers rely on the shared public water facilities to beat the heat. And with roughly one pool complex serving every 160,000 New Yorkers, pools and all two scarce cooling source in a city where heat vulnerability reflects racial and economic disparities. This problem became especially visible last summer when the majority of New York City public pools were closed due to pandemic. So pools were not reopened as they usually are for, are they, are usually for the uh, Memorial Day weekend, um, but they kind of reopened towards the end of the summer as it was confirmed that actually the kind of COVID-19 cannot be trans transmitted through the, the kind of water that it's um, that it's clean and, and kind of purified enough that, that it wouldn't basically pass on. The disease. So 50, only 15 out of active 65 pools were open uh, towards the end of the summer. But of course, there's just like a drop in the sea of heat um, for, for a city that it's definitely kind of struggling with the heat during the summers. So with the closure of pools, beaches, playgrounds, and spray showers, people actually turned to swimming in unprotected natural bodies of water for cooling and recreation, which again brought back concerns of the public safety, public health, and again, the kind of um, scary statistics of drowning has spiked up. Um, so with the kind of heat 
last year, but generally and looking into future, many communities are forced to improvise solutions. And in Red Hook, a coalition of local organization um, last year, and I believe this year as well, helped establish a network of pop-up pooling infrastructures throughout the neighborhood, um, acknowledging the particular dangers or overheating facing lower income communities of color, especially. And New York City Water on the Go program, uh, which is a kind of DEP um, kind of program to connect the kind of water drinking station to the hydrant um, is present and kind of deployed usually during summer. Um, and also this kind of project uh, by actually a friend architect, um, Tay Carpenter and Chris Webkin, um, new public hydrant is a kind of another attempt to kind of show not only that the water in New York City is clean and easily accessible, if not through the water tap and simply through kind of water hydrant. And it's, it should be made accessible, especially during the, the summer months. So those kind of attempts are actually not unlike the Lindsay's era policies where kind of smaller temporary kind of quick solutions um, were actually very effective in, um, in kind, of, um, kind of addressing the issues um, of the heat um, and a kind of public space and access to water um, in general. So with that, um, maybe the history of public pools in New York City kind of helps us to trace kind of reciprocal relationship between the architectural invention and policy making and how both the kind of architecture, but also location policies um, and other aspects of the of thinking about um, pools, but public space at large in the city, it's really important. So in, the, in the light of recent and hopefully receding COVID-19 crisis, along with the growing and interconnected impact of inequality and climate change, pools have perhaps new critical roles to play in the urban environment. And in my opinion, um, I'm not necessarily advocating for building more of the pools, but I think the pools that we have can take on novel functions, whether through adjustment of their physical footprint or expanded programming, um, the facilities that operate only a fraction of the year, which is usually Memorial Day to, to Labor Day, which is maximum three months, could open the doors to other functions and users during offices and times, offering more permanent space for social gathering, education, and health. And with every summer seemingly getting hotter than the last, the need for expanded water infrastructure will be critical for making sure that New Yorkers can continue to keep cool when it matters the most. So such overdue changes require an integrated social and spatial and architectural approach to addressing both the immediate and long-term needs of the communities that pools um, could serve. How can we use the water infrastructure as a catalyst for building social and urban resilience in the future? Can the water once again become a connective tissue that defines development models for the upcoming decades? Let's, let's discuss. Um, so with that, I wanted to thank you. I also wanted to say that I continue to look at the kind of research and specifically actually at the Kostyushko pool as a kind of site of potential kind of unsolicited proposals of how we could use the pool grounds um, and, and the kind of public space around it um, for more than just the kind of swimming and pooling and kind of create it or turn it again into a kind of very important um, public asset. Um, if there's any questions, is there, if there's more interest in looking into those um, topic, um, on, into this topic and topics that are related, I really encourage everybody to check out um, the articles I've been writing for Urban Omnibus, the NYC H2O website, which also covers um, super interesting stories about not only the, the water system, but also kind of bringing back to life and use the Ridgewood Reservoir, um, the kind of, um, kind of, article about the kind of public versus private pools was recently published in New York Review of Architecture, along with a kind of public pools um, website and a kind of Instagram account that I'm kind of creating in parallel to the whole research. Um, if you're interested, um, you should definitely check those um, sources out. But otherwise, um, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to hear your questions or comments. Thank you, Carolina. That was so interesting. I learned so much. <clears throat> Excuse me. I found it particularly refreshing that that um, fancy architect Morris Lapidus gave back to his old neighborhood and and designed such a beautiful pool. That was the the Kosciuszko pool. Yes. Yeah. He was the designer of the Kosciuszko pool. Beautiful. 
Uh, thank you. So um, this is a, a chance for everyone in the audience to ask their questions. Um, we, you know, we have uh, a lot of all stars in the in the audience, swimmers and New Yorkers that um, I'm sure have some insights and I'm sure have some good questions. So um, it's easiest to to type them in the chat. Um, and uh, so so please uh, go at it. Um, this. Uh, if you did join late, uh, we recorded the, the talk, so we will post it in a day or two. Um, Michael Michonne asks, um, uh, hold on a second, what does he ask? Not the pick of the classic open fire hydrant with a, Michael, what's your question? Sorry. Uh, Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just amazed not to see at least one picture of the classic New York City street scene of kids playing at an open fire hydrant with or without a sprinkler cap. That's a good one. We should. Right? That's right. Yeah. Definitely you got to you got to put that in there. You got classic. it. Well, no, I have to say there was one when I introduced Mayor Lindsay and he was standing with a bunch of kids around the fire hydrant that was sprinkling the oh, water around. Okay. But yes, that's definitely um, part of the water infrastructure. And I don't know um, if everybody knows that you can actually request um, the kind of opening of a hydrant and the kind of applying of a kind of sprinkler to it, um, especially now in the summer, um, if you basically want to use the water from the hydrant. So it's not... It's not illegal, you just have to kind of plan for it. And this is definitely kind of New York City scene that I should have probably um, kind of placed here. It makes me think of the uh, do the right thing scene when there was a kind of hydrant open right where the kind of um, fancy car passes the, the water hydrant. Um, I believe that was also bed neighborhood. Um, so yeah, thank you. That's definitely part of the water infrastructure. Matt, so, Matt? Yes, sir. Can I just add, ask one more question or make one more comment? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, um, uh, is the speaker aware of a situation that happened, I think it was about seven or eight years ago, uh, where one of the public pools essentially closed down for exclusively female um, Orthodox Jewish participants? And, That's right, the uh, net pool, yeah. And, and some and and rightly many New Yorkers took offense that they were basically segregating a public facility uh, and the politicians went through all sorts of hoops to try to uh, condone the behavior uh, on all sorts of grounds that were just transparently obviously a pandering tactic to the Hasidic community. Yeah, I, I remember that. Um, I a lot of my swimming friends swim at the Met Pool and uh, were uh, were disappointed by it. Um, uh, Carolina, do you uh, do you want to comment on that or? Um... Yeah, no, I'm yeah I'm aware of that, and I know definitely that was the Metropolitan Pool, which is the the former bath facility that was then turned into a kind of public recreational center. And I know that there were, I believe there were just like times that were designated to that specific. Um, um, that specific group, which, you know, try to accommodate their kind of needs and kind of religious beliefs. And um, as I was saying earlier, like the pools are actually the places where a lot of kind of tensions and kind of um, contested ideas are actually um, resurfacing. Um, that's why I'm looking at it because I, as an architect, I started looking at them more through kind of architectural lens. But as soon as I started reading about the histories and stories about it and the kind of data, you start to see kind of much larger kind of issues um, and potentials as well that each pool holds um, and that we should be discussing. So yes, that's definitely um, part one of those stories. Thank you, Michael. Um, so Hannah asked, uh, despite an understanding that COVID would not transmit at outdoor pools, uh, very few city pools opened last summer. This year, the outdoor pools are open for the full season, but without the usual learn to swim and lap swim programs. Also breaking with recent precedent, the pools are not staying open late during heat emergencies. Um, I, I, uh, I hadn't heard that. Interesting. 
the city has cited a lifeguard shortage as an issue. Um, do you know uh, if that is the full story and what can we do to expand pool activities next summer? And before you answer, I am gonna ask if uh, uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh would, would be interested in, in commenting. You don't have to. It, Uh, thank you, Matt, and uh, welcome. Yes, nice to see you. Nice to see you too, and thank you for the uh, very interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, yes, the uh, pools, all of the outdoor pools are open except Lasca Pool, of course, uh, which is closed for a total uh, reconstruction, and as well as three other pools that are in the midst of uh, reconstructions this summer as well. Uh, but yes, we uh, uh, there are limits to our lifeguard staffing. We typically hire fourteen to fifteen hundred lifeguards every year for both the beaches and the pools. This year, we were only able to hire a thousand uh, or so. Uh, it's uh, complicated, there's a lot of reasons for it, primarily because for the last two uh, indoor swimming seasons, there was no indoor swimming season. We rely heavily on the public school system to provide new lifeguards every year, and they simply were not um, functioning and did not have uh, swimming programs for the last two springs. So uh, we were we weren't able to recruit the numbers that we typically have. Uh, there are regulations about uh, staffing levels that are required to open pools. So we are only able to open uh, for what we call the general session from 11 to seven. Uh, we are extending pool hours. We have today, tonight, today, tomorrow, and uh, Friday, as we did during the last heat wave. Uh, the first heat wave that hit us was right when the outdoor pools opened and uh, we simply weren't uh, uh, in our mid-season mode and, and couldn't uh, extend the hours during that heat wave. But we have since then and we are this week. And uh, we are also looking forward to uh, resuming our normal uh, amount of programming next summer. Uh, we will need lifeguards if anyone knows of young men and women or even older men and women uh, who are interested in being lifeguards, they should uh, direct them to our website and we'll be happy to work with them. Uh, to see if they can uh, become lifeguards and uh, help us keep the pools open next summer. Great, thank you, Liam. Awesome. Uh, okay, uh, Stacy um, is joining us from Pennsylvania and is uh, an artist that does a lot of work in Philly. Uh, she knows that in Philly, the hack for urban pools is to clean out a dumpster, line it with plastic, and fill it up with water. Cool. Yeah, I was quite tickled to see that mobile pool. Um, what a what a cool thing. So yeah. I think yeah. if I can just maybe add to that, um, that I think the mobile pools were actually reenacted at some point at one summer um, a couple of years ago in New York City. So it was indeed the kind of a large container <laughs> lined with plastic and the kind of place I believe next to Grand Central. Um, and other locations. So there are, of course, items to kind of bring the pool again, and I kind of maybe through this kind of more, I would call it like tactical urbanism than the kind of large construction. And perhaps it's just part of the discussion as well of how um, we can think of pools as more than just a kind of big kind of enterprises and uh, maybe even the kind of shortage of the lifeguards has to do with size of some of those pools, right? I mean, if you have an Olympic size pool, you also have certain proportional number of lifeguards um, as opposed to the kind of smaller facilities. Uh, so how can we think of those spaces um, also supporting other functions and kind of being a kind of gathering places beyond just the kind of swimming? And I think that's perhaps a way um, to move forward um, with that. Um, and to be promoted through activities like that or through the kind of maybe more kind of smaller scale, uh, quicker in deployment uh, ways of bring awareness uh, about water and a kind of importance of the public space for everybody. Yeah, I, I, I think that, um, you know, that it, it would be so incredible if, especially in light of this recent infrastructure bill that's making its way through Congress to, as you say, expand on the programming and the, the, the timing and the amount of usage of our existing outdoor pools you know, for example, if we could deck over, um, you know, the Hamilton Fish Pool, if we could deck over the FDR Drive, 
you know, an active highway. We can deck over a, you know, a 50 meter pool. Um, and, yeah. you know, and at, at Lasker pool, they, you know, they readily make it um, an ice skating rink. And so they could, you know, just as soon do that at um, McCarran and, and Hamilton fish for sure. So, yeah, I mean, I think definitely that's one of the ways to think about it. And I know I, when I talked to um, a former parks commissioner, Adrian Benepi, um, as a kind of interview for the articles, he also mentioned that city actually looked at that in like 2008, 2012, as a kind of way to expand the, the kind of um, time when the pools could be used. It didn't go ahead for a kind of number of reasons, but it was a kind of idea that was entertained. I don't, you know, think it's a cool solution for all the pools, and I don't think all the pools should have that. But um, why not try it? And why not think of how, if we're not using the pool for swimming, how can be safely how the grounds of the pool can be safely used where the pool actually the pool is not in use um, itself. So I think you know it's a kind of question to both the kind of policymakers, but also architects and people like me or, or others who are working with public space and, and kind of know also what communities need. And I just mentioned that I'm looking into Kostiuszko specifically because it's my neighborhood pool, but also because I know people who grew up going to that pool and kind of they kind of conveyed to me how important that pool was for them as part of their growing up, but also just um, a kind of as a kind of city dweller. And um, I, I was really kind of sad to see that pool close last year. Um, I was I'm generally sad when I pass by it, uh, also because it's such an interesting architectural element uh, when it's closed during the off pool season. And I keep thinking of how that playground that was designed by Morris Lapidus, maybe now it's not like up to ADA and codes, could be kind of brought back as a kind of public space, a gathering space, an event space um, um, for people who live um, in the city and who would definitely um, take advantage of that space. Yeah, so, so interesting. Um, somebody wrote a question. I'm going to read it and um, uh, please chime in if I'm not uh, getting the gist of it. Are there any plans in the near future to build pools in the neighborhoods uh, with new tall buildings, but for the public? If I may, I think um, maybe the, the question is about you know, all these new developments coming up and even sometimes they cut deals to provide some sort of quote unquote public access to a green space. So maybe the asking about if there's any plans for these public pools, quote unquote, quote unquote or otherwise. Oh, interesting. As part of like a concession for a developer, you know, they, they, they would, you know, do a, a public benefit by building a, a a park like like domino park or in this case a pool yeah i think yeah there's maybe another um resource i can point everybody to i think tomorrow urban omnibus is going to publish a third article in the series undercurrents which is like co-authored with um new york review of architecture um editors and actually talks about the kind of switch from the kind of what i was talking about the kind of public pools kind of being kind of defunded um, at certain time, but kind of public uh, private pool construction spiking up. And that um, graph that I was showing actually refers to the multiple family housing projects. But if you look at um, the kind of proportion of like one pool in a kind of large uh, residential luxury tower versus um, one pool in the Frack City, which is also a multiple residential neighborhood, you know, it's a different scale and proportion of people to the water. Um, and there is definitely a spike in construction of um, public swimming pools recently, um, as we see a lot of construction going on in New York City. And actually, that's a really interesting question. Um, if those facilities could be in some way also used by public, um, I assume they're not necessarily, um, but definitely an interesting um, way to think about that. Good. Maybe we'll have um, two more questions, and um, and we can continue the conversation. Uh, everyone is welcome to to email info at nych two o, and again, we're going to post this uh, talk in a couple of days on Instagram and and Facebook. Um, uh, have there ever been studies to have fire hydrants not be a part of the drinking water system? 
I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, is the person who asked that still still on? Would they like to comment? Yeah, that would allow for uh, use of, of fire hydrants to be open more readily than just sprinkler tops, and the use of and also cut back on the, the need for more drinking water. You know, in terms of having separate water systems. I don't know how feasible it is. Just wondering if it's ever been looked at. I, I don't I know about that there. study or I haven't heard about it. I mean, the, the one thing to emphasize is that New York City actually has relatively reliable and clean um, water source. And it's relatively um, kind of easily accessible. Therefore, that water is not actually being separated for the kind of clean one and not clean one. And we have the same kind of water flowing through the water taps in our homes as through water hydrants. And I don't know if, if there is actual necessity or savings or efficiency that would be gained from separation of that. Um, but that I would say it's a kind of question maybe to experts and DEP. Um, one thing that I, I think it's maybe important to talk about the kind of water kind of flows and contamination is the kind of um, the, the water sewer overflows where which are actually emptying to, to our rivers, right? And, um, and basically polluting the waters at the times of the kind of high um, high uh, rainfalls. And I also know that, um, for example, Plaspool, who is, um, you know, claiming and kind of develop the technology to clean the water is also going to adapt to the times where that um, the sewer water overflow is going to be higher, therefore pollution in the river is going to be kind of increased versus times where the water is relatively, um, I wouldn't say clean, but kind of <laughs> less, less polluted um, as it's as the kind of um, sewers are not overflowing. So I think there is um, a lot to talk about the kind of water kind of flows and how to manage them. I'm not sure if kind of separating kind of hydrants and water taps was part of the discussion and if it brings any um, kind of savings or efficiencies. Got it. Uh, I, I'll ask the last question um, just as more of a thought question. There are several old pools like in, in old school buildings that are not functional. Would you prioritize fixing those or building new outdoor pools? Um, I would say um, I'm going to put my architect hat now and I'm going to follow with the Pritzker Prize winners from last year. The Pritzker Prize is an architecture award for like the best architects um, and it was awarded to Lacan Tom Vassal, um, French architects and their kind of motto is like um, don't um, I probably I'm paraphrasing it so don't take my words exactly as they are but basically they're saying don't uh, first don't destroy um, and basically reuse the buildings that we have and I think generally thinking about the kind of development of cities like construction um, the density and the kind of climate change um, I think we should maximize reusing the facilities that we have and have capacities to take on the functions they held, but or maybe new functions or kind of expanded kind of roles, um, and then look at the kind of construction of potential new facilities. So I think you know there's actually quite a lot of pools in New York City, and I think there's could be a lot of interesting kind of work done around it, uh, around them and with them. Um, and I think that I would prioritize that. But um, as fan of the pools, I would, I would never say no to another pool, but I think it has to be kind of also kind of considered where and how and what it kind of brings um, to a discussion and what kind of policy uh, is bringing um, with it. Um, as we saw, there were like different ways of approaching kind of pool construction in the past. What are we trying to do or what would we try to do if we were to construct a new pool um, now? That's great. Makes sense. Um, well, uh, thank you, Carolina, so, so much. That was a fascinating and thought provoking talk. Um, I, I learned a lot. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, thanks for David for helping this run smoothly. Um, again, we're gonna post this in a couple of days. If you have more questions, uh, feel free to email them. And uh, we hope to see you at a H2O event soon. Um, and we hope to present uh, Carolina and, and some more of her research uh, in person. And hopefully things will hopefully. keep going in the right direction. That's right.
Um, yeah. So, so thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you, Carolina. Thank you, thank you, Matt. Thank you, everyone. And uh, please go to the pool this summer. <laughs> thank you, Carolina. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night.